Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to another episode of the Virgin Stars podcast, third season. How my loyal listeners, thank you for continued support. It's an amazing episode because Mike Sizemore boards the mullet ship to discuss Storm Kids Fetch, book two, The Rescue from Storm King Comics. Now come on board as we go traversing the stars. Hi, Mr. Sizemore. Thank you so much for coming to the Traversing Stars podcast. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I always start off with a question of inspiration. So what inspired your love for comics and who are your earliest influences? Oh, that's an easy one. Um, I grew up um, here in the UK reading 2000 AD from a, a very early age. Um, that was like weekly um, kind of just anti-fascist propaganda slapped in my face. You know, you had Judge Dredd. Strontium Dog. You had uh, writers like Alan Moore doing doing Future Shocks. It was kind of like um, uh, like a, a base camp of, of like all the classic kind of eighties sci fi adventure heroes kind of delivered to me once a week. So um, I, I grew up with that. The only blind spot it's given me over the years is um, as a kid I never read that that much American comics. Um, so for, for the longest time, you know, I, I read a little bit of Superman and Batman, but not much. And I was aware of the, the other characters, but, um, it probably wasn't until I was a teenager that I started reading all that stuff. But yeah, from, from about the age of seven, I was regularly reading Judge Dredd, you know, kind of shooting people in the face because they had illegal coffee or, you know, whatever. So, yeah, it's very different kind of comic upbringing, I think, than, than a lot of American writers have. So, speaking of the, so what do you think is the specific difference between British and American comics then? Um, we, we don't take ourselves very seriously. That's a big part of it. And we tended to see the gritty side of things in comic books, superheroes and stuff kind of way before the Vertigo line started, for example. If, if you read some of the the early attempts at kind of British superheroes, um, they, they were usually already quite dark. Um, I, I, did a, I did a blog post years ago. I, I found an old Superman comic where obviously he was doing what he does, you know, truth, justice, the American way, saving puppies, all that stuff. And the same week that was published in the States, there was um, a Judge Dredd story appeared called The Cursed Earth. And one of my favourite panels is the the bad guys, the angel gang, have taken over um, a, a house and they've, they've taken the occupants hostage. And it's just a background panel where they take they have to keep the hostages quiet. So one of them is putting a full-sized coat hanger inside this guy's mouth. And then... He, hangs him with the rest of his family in the wardrobe. And, and it's just a background gag. That'll keep them quiet. We'll hang them in the in the wardrobe. And it was the exact same week that, you know, Superman was off saving a dog or something. So it's, it, it just blew me away when I saw those were published the same week because it really underlined the difference between what eight-year-old British kids were reading and what eight-year-old American kids were reading. So, you know, it's kind of in our DA to be a little bit messed up, I think. <laughs> so you're now the writer of Storm Kids Fetch, book two, The Rescue. So how did you get yeah. involved in the series and what intrigued you most about it? Um, it was the, I've never done a kids book before before I did Fetch. So this is volume two. Um it was a chance for me to try something new. It was a chance for me to play around with uh Greek mythology, which I'd I'd been learning about since I was about eleven here in the UK. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of well-versed in that and I wanted to do a modern spin on it. And, um, also it was the first book I did that, uh, my own kids could read because working with John Carpenter, normally every other page is an exploding head or, you know, ultra violent, really horrific stuff that we have a lot of fun making, but for my seven and five year old, <laughs> this is a top shelf or daddy's books are on the top shelf you can't read them for another 10 years so um the great thing about fetch was they, they can read it and they enjoy it and um i've suddenly found 
um, a new audience of, of, of kids, which is great because that, unlike adults, they just tell you the truth. There's no filter. So if they don't like something, they'll let you know. <laughs> and the biggest complaint I've had is because there's about a year between the two books. And I finish it on a cliffhanger and every kid has really enjoyed the book but they all want to kick me in the shins for leaving them on a cliffhanger that they've had to wait so long for. So even like my, my neighbor's kids have read the first one and I went over there the other day and they are clamoring to get the second one because they've been waiting a year to find out what happened. So um, yeah, it's been a lot of fun doing something different. So it's kind of interesting. Um, so um, you're working with the, the very legendary director, John Carpenter and is, uh, Sandy King as uh, wife, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm understanding correctly. So how yeah. does this actually work? So I mean, are they coming up with the idea and kind of filtering down to you? Are you coming up to them with an idea? How is this working? Um, we've done it always. We've done it always so far. So um, originally, the one of the first books I did with them um, was a, a, a kind of sci-fi space horror called Vortex. And um, that was from an idea that Sandy and John had been working on for a while. And they wondered if it would work as a comic book. So they brought it to me and we threw it around a little bit. And um, John had just released his Lost Themes album, which I'd been listening to a lot. And the first track on that was called Vortex. So I pitched the name for this story that they'd already had. And we put in a bunch of John Carpenter references from, from his movies. And uh, but, it, but it was kind of nerve wracking. It was, I'd, I'd done a, a short story for them before, but this was the first kind of longer piece. It ended up being eight issues and then it got collected into a trade. So... Before all that, though, we had to get these pages to John and see if he enjoyed them. So I'm kind of sat opposite him as he's reading stuff that I've just printed out. And uh, thankfully, he laughed. I think it was, again, someone's head exploded and he thought that was hilarious. So we got the green light and and, and off we went. It, it did well enough that we collected it into a trade. And then we did a sequel. Um, and then fast forward to Fetch. That was completely my idea. Um, we were at New York Comic Con together and uh, we were setting up one morning. I was chatting to Sandy and John and Sandy had just lost um, the dog, you know, so was, that was all still kind of tender. And we were talking, I was talking about pets that I'd lost and kind of there on the spot, I said, how about a story about a kid who's lost her dog and she goes to hell to bring it back? And at the time, we weren't too sure what age group this was going to be aimed at, because you could go quite dark with something like that and go, mm. you know, full Hellraiser or something. But we decided it would work better as a book for kids because the themes of loss and um, blame, you know, dealing with that was was kind of a big issue for kids. And the whole point of Storm Kids as a, as a, a brand is it's a kind of pathway into the... Uh, the books for the older kids and then, you know, the, the adult stuff. Because when Sandy and John looked around, a lot of the stuff that was being aimed at, like, eight-year-olds wasn't kind of tough enough or tricky enough. You know, it was all very simplistic. Um, so we wanted to do something that worked on a few different levels. So so th that's what we came up with. And then the other element that I added is uh, my son is uh, uh, on the spectrum. So I wanted to put an autistic character into the story as well. And um, one of the things that I've not been drawn to over the years is when they drop an autistic character into a story, the autism tends to be like a superpower. Yeah. Like, they, you know, they're really good at this one thing and that helps them through the story or whatever. And um, my seven-year-old, as I got to know him over the years and, and, you know, learn what makes him tick, it doesn't feel like a superpower. You know, he... He's a regular kid. He just he just ticks over a little differently from other kids. And especially when my daughter then came along and seeing how they work together, because she she isn't autistic and he is, um, that kind of became the the elements I wanted to talk about in, in Fetch. So we have this character, the the older girl who uh, goes after the dog and accidentally takes her brother along, who's a few years younger, but also autistic. And he takes it all in his stride, just like my son would. You know, everything's an adventure. There's skeletons popping up, there's monsters popping up, there's massive fights going on. And he just sees the whole thing as, as hilarious. Um, so that was a the big part of what we wanted to do. Um, 
and then just kind of like working on the editing side of it with, with John and Sandy just to make sure we were hitting those points um, and making sure it worked at an adult level for our older readers, but also primarily um, it would give the kids something that they hadn't quite read before. So, yeah, I think we pulled it off. Well, I really appreciate it. Um, some viewers may or may not know, I've, I've been a teacher for uh, nine years, the last seven years I've worked with um, special ed populations. I'm such a teacher now, and I worked for six years at a, a school for kids who, who were mostly autistic. And so okay. I, I definitely appreciate you doing that in the story, and I appreciate how you um, did make him an actual person. And I, and I and I do know what you're saying with the idea of the superpower. You know, oh, they're mon amazing at counting or blah blah blah. It's like, well, you know, some kids are just <laughs> autistic; <laughs> they don't necessarily have a superpower. <laughs> you know, this is a great thing. And I, I think I, I greatly appreciate the realism you added to that. So thank you so much. It, it, thank you. It's it, it's nice to hear and. That is kind of what we wanted. We wanted that element of realism in a magical story that has, you know, cyclops and minotaurs hmm. and, and uh, you know, and, and deals with death um, as a big part of the story. So, um, yeah, it, it, I was a little bit nervous writing it, but, you know, we're on book two now already. So I can I can look back on book one and say, yeah, we really did it. And it works. Um, and I'm hoping we get the same response from from book two. But the. Uh, we sent some preview copies out, and the early reviews we've had have been great. I, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not too worried. I got to read it, so I greatly appreciate it. Um, so one yeah. thing when, when you're when you're writing it, um, obviously working very closely with John Carpenter and Sandy King, mm -hmm. um, and it's technically it's their company. Um, when you're thinking about voice, are you trying to write it so it's a Carpenter story, or is it a, a Sizemore story? How, how are you kind of balancing whose voice is being told through the story? I, I think I did do that at the beginning. I think if you read Vortex, I was maybe trying a little too hard in places to make sure it it felt like a Carpenter movie mm. within the pages. Um, and the weird thing is doing the short... John puts out a Halloween book every year. It's, it's been going about 10 years now, I think. And um, I got invited to do a few of those. And those were more like what I, I read as a kid in 2000 AD. They were, they were shorter... Um, some of them have like twist endings and you, I didn't have the time really to worry about that stuff. And it was, that was purely me. Um, and I think doing those has helped me find a way to not be overawed by the fact that this is a John Carpenter book, mm -hmm. because like everyone else in the world, I was a huge fan for, you know, years before, um, uh, before I met and worked with him. So, um, and to be honest, he doesn't really appreciate that that level of kind of geekiness where you know everything about his movies inside and out because he doesn't like talking about them. Um, and where we first bonded was actually talking about 1950s black and white sci-fi movies, which he's he's much happier to talk about than his own work. Um, that and college basketball, but I know nothing about that. So that's that's when we fall apart, unfortunately. <laughs> So well, that's like nineteen. That's so. What is it about nineteen fifty sci fi that you find so fascinating? The thing, I, well, okay. So Sandy had invited me over to meet John for the first time, and we, I, I was very nervous, and um, I had no plans that we would ever work together. It was just an opportunity to meet one of the greatest living movie directors and someone that I'd grown up watching the movies of. So. Um, we went over for coffee and cake at John's house and, you know, John is passing me cake and I'm thinking this is so surreal. This is so odd. And I did, I think what everyone does, I started talking about the thing and big trouble, not China. And I could see that he wasn't that engaged because that's what everyone does. Yeah. And um, I brought one of my favorite sci-fi movies from back in the day uh, from the fifties, which is um, in the UK, it was released as the Trollenberg terror. But for the American audience, they called it the crawling eye, which gives away the ending of the movie when you finally see the aliens. And it has the worst special effects in the last five minutes of the film. They are absolutely terrible. And it would make the film completely laughable if the first 60 minutes or so weren't done so well and so brilliantly. And it was just tension filled and an incredible piece of science fiction that not a lot of people talk about. And luckily enough, not only was John a huge fan of it, one one of the DVD re DVD releases, he'd done an audio track for it, talking about it, 
Um, so that's that's the thing we connected on. And as a Carpenter fan, if you watch it now, you start seeing elements in it of the fog and Prince of Darkness. Um, so it, it's a fun one to watch to see like how it influenced John, you know, who, who saw it as a kid when it first came out. Um, and that's kind of what we bonded on. Um, and so that first invite then became a second invite to swing by the office. And within a few weeks, we were working together. So it was just, you know, luck more than anything else. If I'd have gone in there completely fanboyish, I would never have been invited back, I don't think. Well, I guess there's an interesting uh, lesson there, right? Um, find something more interesting to discuss than sycophancy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I, I mentioned this the other day to someone else, but... Um, I, I've been lucky enough to meet a lot of my uh, heroes over the years. And I've met a lot of directors and um, musicians. And again, they don't really want to talk about the work, but they get really excited to talk about the stuff that influenced them. So that's kind of the, the, the track I take now whenever I meet someone new. I don't care how big the, the film is or whatever it is that they've done. We talk about the things that influence them and, and that seems to work better. Not so much for actors because actors just love talking about the latest <laughs> thing. But um, yeah, it's, it, it's been fun. You know, I've, I've been in London now um, since my kids were born seven or so years ago. Um, but I used to spend a lot of time in LA. So, you know, we were constantly running into people in meetings and stuff. Um, less so now that uh, I'm, I'm back in London. So I think one of the interesting things about Sweat that you did right as well is, as you mentioned, you include a lot of characters from the Odyssey. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. From Homer's, Homer's Odyssey. And I think, um, you know, I think you did a great job. As someone who's also taught um, the Odyssey in school, I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, so why are these the ideal characters to appear within Danny's, is it Danny or Danny's? Uh, Danny. Uh, uh, Danny's well, journey. Um. They're still around, you know. What? Why are they making a Fall Guy movie now? Because a few people remember the eighties uh, TV show. Um, these guys have been around a way, way longer um, time period, um, and I think there's a reason we keep going back to them. That you know, they're, they're the original archetypes of, of of different characters. You know, uh, uh, discussing American comics, a, a lot of people talk about Superman and Batman as being this kind of like the version of gods, you know, for, for yeah. a younger country that doesn't have um, a mythological Parthenon, you created your own. Whereas kind of here in Europe, we're so old, we've got this stuff to keep keep going back to. Um, but I was very lucky. I had my first classics lesson when I was about 11. And um, my teacher on the very first lesson, Rather than do the Odyssey, we were starting with the Iliad, which is a much harder chunk, especially for an 11-year-old. Mm. Um, when it gets going, the battles and everything are crazy. It's brilliant. But there's a lot of stuff you have to get through before you get to that point. And the way that my teacher got us into it is he played the clip from The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. Um, so we had all the Morricone music. We had Sergio Leone's stuff on the screen and a lot of the kids in the class had never seen that i my dad was a huge western fan so we had all those movies and i absolutely loved spaghetti westerns so i immediately you know went forward and wanted to know more about classics because he was connecting it to something that i already thought was brilliant and after the scene was over he was kind of going okay so eastwood basically achilles you know and we're like oh my god you're right you know because that's the thing with these these stories. You can go back to the 50s, 60s, 70s and find these connections because th these stories are, are so old. We've been tapping into them forever. So it was just a no-brainer, to be honest. I mean, I, I've I studied this from 11 till like 20-something. So, you know, my background in it was was good enough that I figured we, we can do it justice. You know, but it had to be simple enough for the kids to enjoy it but also modernize it so not everyone was walking around in togas um and you know that i think we what we tried to do is is give everyone a reference point that uh that they could understand a little bit better um you know and and clash of the titans remake and and um percy jackson and all that stuff it, it's everywhere so you know it wasn't a hard sell really for kids to get into it they love that stuff 
Well, um, when thinking about how to write the characters for a dialogue, hmm. were you leaning towards thinking, you know, did you want to make them sound like old school? Almost, I know Shakespeare is after the Iliad, but when people write these characters from long ago, they kind of give them that kind of like classic dialogue. Or do you want to keep it more modern as as so for modern readers? What what was your determination? Term, determining factor? We, we, we definitely we definitely wanted to keep it modern. We did discuss this a little bit because they meet so many old old souls in, in in the book, really old characters. But what we tried to do with the visuals is make sure that the kids could understand that even though the gods of Olympus have been there forever, they've got cell phones and they're watching part of Danny's adventure as it streams alive from Hades. So we, we gave them all these touchstones so they could be surrounded by Greek pillars and, and everything looked like in Clash of the Titans, for example. But there was a very modern aesthetic that was running all the way through it. Um, so, you know, you, there's a particular goddess in it who you see is a teacher at the beginning. And it's only right at the end of the story do you get to see her all in her armour and, you know, it... it, it that's so a kind of Wonder Woman moment, if 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 you like, for want of a better phrase. Um, so yeah, but we wanted to keep it easy to understand for the kids because you know it's aimed at eight year olds. So you know we, we didn't want to give them homework. So I, th I think it's kind of interesting the idea of Danny going into Hades. Um, it seems like something that would be impossible or assumed to be impossible for any adult, but a kid who doesn't understand limitations yet thinks it's totally a possible thing to do. So. Is her youth her most valuable asset along this journey? Um, I think she's a determined kid. And she's been offered all the sensible routes to deal with what's happened to her dog. You know, people have tried to move it on. Um, as you do when, when someone's struggling with grief and you say all the wrong things or you say all the right things that, that you're supposed to say to get them through that. Danny is just stubborn and doesn't want to know. And this is kind of a, a Hail Mary pass. She reads about Hades for the first time and recognises an illustration in the book to a place she used to go when she was younger as a kid. And it's, it's one of those what if moments, you know, possibly, maybe that is the entrance to Hades. I'll, I'll go and check it out. But we set it up so, say an adult had stumbled in, into that gateway and ended up, you know, uh, with Cerebus, the free dog, the free headed dog of hell. Mm. Um, no one but Danny was getting past that guardian because of the quest that Danny was on. You know, you could be a scholar of mythology who's tracked it down and want to go to Hades, and that dog would probably just eat you. You know, it was only when the guardian at the gate discovers why Danny wants to go to Hades. She's there to get a dog back. And Cerebus is a dog. So they connect on that level. And all the way through, Danny just has this natural charm to disarm people. So when she meets Medusa, she wants to know the names of the snakes. She's not terrified by this monster with snakes for her. It's just like, oh, are these your pets? You know, so she has that all the way through. Um, and it's only when she meets Hades, the, the the god of hell, for the first time, that she she hits a brick wall because he's having none of this. You know, his job is to keep the dog there and her out. And also, he doesn't really like Odysseus. So, um, it was fun to to kind of take those characters and drop them in front of Danny to see how she'd get around them. Um, you don't really know this until you're writing it. it. It's a bit of a cliche, but the the characters lead the way for you once you start writing. Mm. So when so in the story, once you have Danny, you have uh, Odysseus, uh, mm -hmm. um, Am I saying the name right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Cyclops, um, the Siren, who I don't, I could not pronounce the name, so I'm not going to try. <laughs> That's fine. Um, they all are kind of looking towards Danny as she had kind of leadership role a little bit. What do all yeah. these characters see in her? Because I mean, Odysseus is a leader of men. I mean. Not only in the Iliad with the Greeks, um, he's talking about um, tropes. He's what Batman would be back in the day. He's that guy. Yeah. Um, the Odyssey, he's even more so of a leader, though he does lose everybody. He's still <laughs> led for a while um, bravely. Why are they willing to put aside some of their own ego and think for Danny? Well, 
the, the fun thing about Odysseus, especially when we first meet him, he's not he's not changed. Um, you know, he, he he went to war back in the day. Um, it took him ten years after that to get home, um, and he still managed to be adventuring. You know, so he hasn't changed one bit. And the interesting thing about him, especially in the Odyssey, when you read it, is he's a bit of an asshole. He makes huge mistakes. He's got a massive ego. He gets his crew killed, turned to pigs, eaten, because his ego won't let him get past certain stages where he has to scream, I'm Odysseus, I'm a hero, yeah. I'm going to win this. And the next thing, you know, he gets blasted 10 years back uh, and, you know, his crew are all dead. So I, part of this was to give him an opportunity to grow out of that. He's been like a teenager his entire life for centuries. And suddenly he meets Danny, who's, you know, years, years younger than him from how they look, but also centuries younger than him. But she's got a better head on his, her shoulders than he's ever had. So she, you know, he kind of just falls in line eventually because his instinct, as you see every time the skeletons pop up, he just wants to run at them with his sword and start, you know, cutting heads off and he wants to do that all the way through the quest whereas Danny's the one holding him back saying hey what if there's a different way so by the end of book two I hope you see that it, this wasn't so much about saving Danny's dog as it was about saving Odysseus mm -hmm. from that version of himself um, and I think the other characters who, who are the supporting cast see the same thing within her that you know this kid is special and doing something that we haven't seen done before and they want to be a part of that um whereas the bad guys that line up against her just completely uh, misunderstand what they're up against and and uh, you know pay the price so yeah it was fun to put together now i'm, I'm gonna give a quote um, if it if, it's, if it is a spoiler let me know and i'll cut this part out but it's a mm -hmm. good quote so i want to say it's from uh polyphemus um he says about the existence of the um, in the underworld. He says, "The longer you are in Hades, the dimmer that life becomes. You focus on one thing until it becomes your world." So, what is the danger of w one living their life in this way? Well, I think Odysseus is in that trap. Um, he's just sat there waiting for the next adventure. That's all he's ever known. And the the adventure he goes on with Danny ultimately gives him a way out. Um, I think the danger for Danny being stuck there is that the quest would never end. You know, mm. right up until things happen to her brother, she's very fixated on getting the dog back. And you could sort of see that if it didn't go the way that it went, she could have been down there for centuries, taking on monster after monster and the dog's just over the next hill. Um, but that all kind of fades away because her, her brother ends up in jeopardy and she has to save him so um it's not that her original quest to save the dog was it was in any way you know um silly it it, it meant the world to her but suddenly the, the stakes have changed um so i i guess when you when you talk about the, the mythological version of hades and other underworlds there's always a danger of of, of being trapped there you know, whether it's because you've eaten food or you turn back when you're not supposed to. And, you know, the, 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 there's all those uh, tropes. Um, uh, and what, one of the things that we wanted to do as well with it, when you look at it visually, we didn't want this to be a dark book for kids set in gloomy caves, uh, you know, which the underworld is generally like that. So first chance we get once she's through that first portal it looks more like a Windows 95 screensaver. It's green hills and blue Simpson skies with white clothes. You know, we, we wanted to open the world up differently and make it look fun and filled with adventure for the kids. Hmm. And that as well, I think, is enticing because she comes from a world of school and homework and regulation. And suddenly she's with a hero on a quest in this wonderful sunlit world filled with wonderful creatures. So I think that that is the the temptation of uh, of these mythological, you know, lands. Um, yeah. Now, um, for some readers, I mean, I'm sure most people know it, but uh, from, from my understanding of how things work, 
Um, sometimes people confuse Hades of Greek myth with Hades of hell, Christian hell. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that Christian hell is a punishment. Hades wasn't meant, from my understanding, Greek myth as a punishment. It's just the place where you go. Now there's like some so. there's some things you have to do. Like um, I do understand, remember they um, you kind of fade over time, and that's why when they come with um, in the Odyssey, they they provide a sacrifice of blood so they can um, get their kind of color back and be able to think clearly. Um, yeah, exactly. So I, th I think for, for the Greeks and for for a lot of cultures, it was when you forget about someone here in the real world, that's when they start to fade away. You know, in in the underworld, um, and the heroes all had a kind of get out of jail free card because if you did a little bit like the Vikings and Valhalla, if you if you did enough heroic tasks, you could be taken to Elysium, you know, which was wine, women, and song for for one of a better phrase. Um, but yeah, you you didn't have to do anything bad to end up in Hades. It's just where you went, um, cool. and then it was it, yeah. Okay, one of the nice things then, um, you know, what you're just saying about if you're a hero or if you do anything famous, I guess you never will be forgotten then, so you never would fade, right? Because you'd be remembered for history. Yeah, oh. and I think it's it's one of the reasons when we see Odysseus, he's still there. You know, he, he hasn't been forgotten, but when you first see him, he's in a bit of a state because it's been a long while since anyone came to seek him out and go on a quest. Hmm. So... Um, you know, I, as I said earlier, this is, this is as much about Danny saving him from that. Um, although when we first meet him, he wouldn't believe that he needed saving. He's having the time of his life, you know. Well, like I, said, I think that's a, a great um, idea. And I think it's a, it's a great quote. Um, it does seem to suggest, though, that being in Hades is not in some level of a punishment because or at least everyone there is stuck um, in um kind of like focus on that one thing so is that a punishment is that just uh, humans doing that to themselves and making it a punishment for themselves um I, I i think you could read it that way i mean i try and i add stuff where the, the people that are there are either they've made the best of it so one of the things we did with the minotaur that has you know not the best story from from his point of view um you know, with with the maze, um, but you know he's an innkeeper now. You know he's he's kind of retired and and you know serves drinks to heroes. Um, so people who were stuck though kind of made the best of it, made it into a home, and um, uh, that was just one of the things that that we wanted to change about that concept of of, of it being you know the worst place. It's just a place. And it's it's how you uh, how you interact with it that that makes it what it is. So, when can the listeners get a copy of Storm Kids Fetch Book Two? Um, I believe it's out uh, very shortly. Well, uh, today is is the fourth. I think it's out on the eighth. Oh, so okay, it's four days. Uh, it, it's available from the Storm Kings website and uh, comic book shops. And I think then later in the month, maybe the twenty fourth around then. Um, you can pick it up on Amazon and other online retailers and regular bookstores. But initially, it's, it's Storm King's website and um, comic book stores should have it. Well, like I said, I really enjoyed the read. I, I enjoyed the callback to ancient Greek myth. Um, it's been an absolute honor to speak with you, sir. Thank you so much. No, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I, I uh, always enjoy uh, talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, it's fun to talk to someone who, who obviously knows so much about this stuff. So, yeah, thank you. Have a great night, sir. You too. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Traverse of Stars podcast. If you tell me better the algorithms, I like and subscribing. Be sure to turn for the next episode when Jeff Russo returns to the mothership to discuss the score to Star Trek Discovery Season 5. To next voyage, travel on.